You're listening to Boosh Radio. Boosh. Boosh. Boosh Radio. Your real talk radio. Dhaka nang kilong kilo bhajanin kong lo moham. State Affairs State Affairs with Edmond Omeo My guest on this part of the program is Jumoke Ugunkeedi. He's the author of the book, A Moment in Time, a life experience in the art of survival, politics, humanity, and activism. Jumoke Ugunkeedi, thank you for featuring on State Affairs. Thank you very much for inviting me. Before we go into your book, I know you lived in America for a long time. Is he a crime to be a black man in America? Normally, it should not have been a crime, but it is the way they treat the black people there, very unfortunately. Uh, you are a suspect. Uh, let me use uh, one little example. There's a Nigerian doctor. He's a surgeon, and he lives in an exclusive area of uh, California. He said each time he drove to his neighborhood, police are following him. He's bought a home there for more than 10 years, but they will still follow him every night. He's a multi-millionaire based on his hard working, and he, he treats most of these Hollywood big stars. But then he's still a suspect, even in his own neighborhood. Did he care to ask them why they follow him? Several times. What did they say to him? They were just say no routine. Um, we're just passing by. You just happen to be going at that time. I have a personal experience. There's this uh, this lawyer is late now. A former senator in the U.S. We became friends. He came to Nigeria with me two, three times, and he saw that and he expressed that I didn't know Nigeria is a, a, a country like this. That our belief was everybody will live on top of trees and things like that. I'm talking the eighties. Then. There came a time his son became 13 years old. A Jewish culture will celebrate a 13-year-old child. That's his pre-adolescence. They call it Bar Mitzma. He invited me. Standing on his, by his door to press the bell, there must have been about 10 police cars on my neck because it's an exclusive white neighborhood and they wanted to know what I was doing there. The man was very embarrassed. Finally, when he came out, he said, I've been to this gentleman's country. I was well received. A police officer misbehaved to my daughter. He, my dad police officer was taken to police headquarters and his uniform taken away. Now look at my country. This is the man who lives here. Why are you treating him like this? That is America for you. Racism will never go away. Activism will forever be active in America. So, would the black ever be emancipated? Uh, because I'm an optimist. Yes. But then it will take a lot of struggle. A lot of struggle? Yes. In your book, you said Jumoke Ugunkede is in a class of one, sitting alone in his own classroom without any classmate. It's like a lone bird flying freely unhindered, taking on the universe. His aim and objective is to touch one and change the world. I like the way you described yourself in your book. I'm thinking loud. Did I write that? Yes, I did, because that's what I believe about life. I believe that, uh, yes, you are created within a multitude, yet you are alone. You will have to struggle hard unless you will do the vices uh, to get along in life. Most things I've achieved in my life, I've had to struggle for. 
whether here or in America. Glory be to God that I have the energy to do the struggling. And I'm still here today. You said you are a rebel. Yes, I am a rebel. A rebel. I could be a Mandela. An Ingeri. Malcolm X. Marcos Garvey. Why did you pick those names? Because those are rebels with causes. Why you talk about Marcos Mosiah Gabe? He was not an indigenous American. Of course, he was born there, but his mother came from, is it Guyana or one of those countries? But he saw what was going on in that enclave and he decided to live a different life, fighting for the right of others. Did he talk about black Jesus? Ah, uh, Malcolm, yes. Because when you look at the Bible and the Bible says God created man in his own image, how could somebody in the image of God be mistreating you if you are of, of the same God? So we must have our own Jesus, we must have our own God. Unless somebody is lying and deceiving the other. If God is one, there shouldn't be discrimination anywhere. And I always think the crazy man on the other side of the road might be me. I'm just lucky to be who I am. And maybe he is lucky. Maybe he is looking at me the way I'm looking at him. And he's thinking that I'm the one that is crazy. It's like when the rain falls. Falls on the eye on us. We take a step to run from the rain. But when we cry, the ants too crawl out of the way. Because the ants see the, the tears coming from our faces. Like the rain drenching him. As we see the, the rain coming from the sky. As a drencher also. So, life is unique. Life is difficult, yet life is sweet. Who firebombed your house in the United States? Yes, uh, it was difficult at a point in time. At that time, we suspected the Nigerian embassy, which is uh, through the United Nations, which was at that time manned by the present chief of staff, Ibrahim Abuola Gambari. And uh, this former military governor of Lagos, Ubamawa. Ubamawa. But I can say this to the record my Abuola Gambari, the current chief of staff, uh, came out openly and he said he could not have done that because he knows, he knew me very well. And did I believe he would have done that? And he said this in the presence of my king, Owa Obokun Adimola of Land. And he's, he was almost swearing to Allah that he would not have anything to do with burning my house. But Marwa took Fifth Amendment. In, Am in America, when you take the Fifth Amendment, it says, you say, I am not saying anything to incriminate myself. So the, it was Marwa that we suspected did it because he boasted once that he had $52 million to suppress the democracy fighters. He was the military attaché at the embassy at the time. He was the military attaché, but he didn't live his life like an attaché. He was running a, diff a parallel uh, uh, government in America. You only suspected, you are not sure. Almost sure, because it was uh, the, um, the police invited uh, him, but he, because he had diplomatic uh, immunity, uh, they couldn't do much with him. Uh, I don't know, we were not able to put a copy of the newspaper in the, in the book. Yes, but that most, if you Google it, you will see that uh, uh, it was a big event at that time. Why were you the target? That was June 15, 1996. Less than uh, uh, six weeks earlier, Chief Anthony Anaro was my guest at home, May 11 of the same year. And uh, earlier, before that, I can say this now, Ambassador Gambari, who is now the chief of staff, had invited me to his uh, home in New York, which is uh, the home of uh, the ambassador to the UN, and said that uh, Pre Governor President um, General Abacha had asked that I be pacified, and they had given him authority to give me whatever I wanted. So did you take anything, or was anything given at any time? I did not take anything. Was it given? Uh, because I did not take, it was not given. But uh, uh, believing in the integrity of uh, Ambassador Gambari, if he had to say something about it, I'm sure he, 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 of course, he would still talk diplomatically because 
is a diplomat, but the truth will come out. But you invited Gambari to the celebration of the first Nigerian day. The first Nigerian day came before the struggle. It was an idea that God gave me that if the Germans could have a German day in America, the British could also have the same day in, the, in, in America. The Colombian and everybody, why not the Africans, particularly Nigerians? So we challenged the, uh, the powers that be in America that there has to be a Nigeria there and we asked for it. Uh, after some time, it was granted. We celebrated the first Nigeria Day, October 6th of that year. If I'm correct, it will be 1992. Abacha hasn't emerged no, as Nigeria's leader at the time. Forget that the, the, the part of that struggle that concerned her was June 12, 1993. Yes. So it was pre-June 12, 1993. And I had known the current chief of staff to be a gentleman, a professor of, uh, uh, of merit at Columbia University. An easygoing uh, academician. But when he started to dabble into oh, the wrong side in politics. Of course, he claimed that he had to represent. He was representing he was the state. Representing, but if you are representing the person that I'm fighting with, you are also fighting with me. So everything we did uh, was since Abacha would not be in America uh, for us to actually confront, we will confront his representative. And that was what happened with uh, uh, Dr. Gambari. So you confronted Gambari? Yeah, but I, I, be, be, I was careful. When I confront somebody, it's on substance. It's not my forte to begin to do personal abuses, which is what he commended me on. That during all of the struggles, there was never a time I did a personal abuse on him. That I was always on point. What this man did is wrong. Uh, what this is the way it should have been. You, you couldn't do it this way. So I was not personal. And so it was not hard for him to come to me and I can say this openly, he apologized to me after he left the position. Why? I guess he felt that, uh, as, as we agreed here, he was doing his job. At the same time, we were doing ours. And I guess he empathized with our position, that we wanted the best for the nation. You collaborated with different organizations in the United States. You knew Louis Farrakhan. Yes. He must have gone very far in American activism. Yes. As a matter of fact, I introduced Hafsa Tabiola to the struggle. She was a student at uh, uh, Yale University or one of those universities. And we wanted, I didn't know MK Abiola as a person. But we knew his daughter. His African friend told me he has a daughter, Hafsa, who incidentally was the same age with my daughter at a university in America. So we invited her to come and testify before the New York Legislative uh, Council uh, to just don't embellish, just tell the story of your family because uh, people like Marwa were sponsoring people uh, to say Kudurat Abiola was a prostitute, he was number 36 of Abiola's wives and Afsa would be crying, why are they saying this about my mother? So I just told her to brace up and challenge them that's your mother I would not be defending your father for you. I only know your father in the realms of activism. And, uh, and she took up the gauntlet. She is what she is today by the grace of God. Because we took her to places in America. Louis Farrakhan, the leader of the Nation of Islam. Tell me about him. When uh, I call him Reverend or Minister Elijah Muhammad, was retiring from being the head of nation of Islam, he handed over to Louisa Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan, Malcolm X, and the whole a lot of them had been in the struggle. And what caught my fancy with them is I'm not Muslim, but I noticed that Muslim knew what the blacks were going through in America. And they would go through the prisons and look at who will be released within the next one year. And so they will cut his friendship. Promised uh, empowerment when he 
get her so that we will not go back to the life of crime. Establish him. Some of them were set up to run restaurants, to run laundry services, and so on and so forth. How did the Nation of Islam raise its money? They pulled their resources, just like the Chinese would do in America, just like the Indians would do. There was this Indian rich man who invested about $200 million within their community. When an India would come to America and he saw that he had no blemish coming from home, he would say, what do you want to do? I want to own a petrol station. Then take him to an Indian who already has a petrol station. You walk there. If you walk there for three years, I'll give you money to buy your own petrol station. And you just have to promise me something. You must repeat that. Help somebody else. The Chinese also, if a Chinese person sells a, a onion here, and I live in Ileife, and there are 10,000 Yoruba people say, on, uh, Americans or uh, selling Chinese uh, selling onions there. A Chinese man will never buy from there. He will travel to Ibadan to buy onions from his people. Then they will share the cost of him coming so that it will not be too much of a burden on him. So they are able to pull their resources by helping one another. And that's exactly uh, what started to go on. Now let me give credit to our people from the Igbo uh, nation. They started that. In America now, the Igbo people are the most uh, coercive. Uh, they will buy homes together, like in Texas. So they will call it retirement homes and help one another to acquire one. This is what the, 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 the Muslim replicated long before the Igbos, of course. And they will go to the uh, prison houses and recruit people who are destitute, destitute, who didn't have a place to go, who didn't have a means of livelihood, and settle them down. Once they are settled down, then you see reason in their religion. Then you become part of them. When you become part of them, you are assigned to a masjid. Mosques are called masjids in America. Uh, you are assigned to a masjid. And uh, the white America was preaching, was saying, oh, they are violent. But then they found out that they are not as violent as they are proclaimed to be. So why was Malcolm X killed? Why was he assassinated? Because he was now getting on their nerves. Mm. If Malcolm X will speak here, half of Ibadan will want to listen to him. It was becoming too problematic for the system in America. So are you saying the system took him out? The system took him out. Because you made an insinuation in your book about the drowning of an Amer African-American activist. Whitney Young. Whitney Young at the Lagos Bar Beach. 1971. And you accused the CIA. No, let, let, let me correct that. I did not accuse the CIA. But if that's the meaning, so be it. But I did not accuse the CIA. I was a young man of uh, 21 going on 22 then. And we just saw when people like Pao Modu who lead the uh, labor union in the streets of Lagos, anywhere in Nigeria, as young people just look at the man and begin to listen to what they're talking about. That uh, people walk and they get compensated as slaves. Then we started to read more in the old Daily Times, which was the most prominent newspaper at that time. Then we thought, it's not bad anyway. They were not violent. Then we joined them in marches around Lagos at a point in time, we started to see that they were fighting for the right of the next person. So Whitney M. Young came to Lagos. As a young man, I want to be honest with you, at that time, I didn't know what he came for. We just knew that it's a black America. Don't forget, that was when the black power movement was just uh, being tempered. Uh, so we saw, now we have had this belief that those people were taken abroad as slaves some three, four hundred years earlier were relatives so if they were marooned there and one of them is coming here to enlighten our people and he just went to take a, a swim at lagos bar beach 
and he died under a mysterious circumstance. When you say mysterious, what really happened? Uh, I, 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 would, I would be lying if I said I actually know what happened. But there was this general belief that because of the position he had taken in America, that he was followed to Nigeria and drowned. And drowned? Yes. And Young is no more? And he's no more. You said when the Black Power Movement was tempered. What do you mean I, by I'm tempered? Using tempered. Maybe it's the wrong choice of word. I, I didn't want to say when it was coming to an end. Uh, it was the middle ground of the Black Power Movement. That was the time the likes of Angela Davis were rising. That was uh, uh, shortly after they killed Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. They killed Malcolm X. They killed Malcolm X. They killed Martin Luther King. They killed at the Cotton Club in New York, and so on and so forth. That's they were trying to contain the black struggle at that time. And as a young man in Nigeria, reading voraciously what was in um, the foreign section of our newspaper, we became charged to know more. And don't forget, it was in the sixties that the American government. Uh, either just trying to suppress Russia's influence in Africa, in West Africa. And so every Wednesday, when we were in high school in the 60s, in the secondary school, they would show us some film at a break time uh, between 12, between 11.30 and 1. It's called Focus on Progress, where they would let us know how beautiful America is, that the poorest man in America can live on the 14th floor, that you can be poor and still ride a long, big cast. They were working on your mind. They did work on our mind. It's a mind game, right? Yeah. So most of us young people now uh, diverted our interest from trying to go to Russia. Now we wanted to go to the U.S. It was the Cold War. It was the Cold War. Uh, Dr. Tunji Otegbeye was at that time was representing the Russian interest. If you have a good grade in... Uh, your school certificate and you apply to russia you get a scholarship you always see long lines in front of dr tunji otegbaya's uh, offices but then we saw that after you won the scholarship and you traveled we didn't hear much of them but in secondary school they were telling us that even if you're poor and when you talk about poverty what will come to my mind the type of life i led having lost my father at the age of uh, four years nine months and six days i saw poverty you saw I, poverty i tasted poverty and i lived po poverty here in Ibadan. and um father had four wives mother was the most productive of the four wives with five children and died certain, suddenly a rich man but the moment he died we became poor so it was difficult to make ends meet so trying to struggle living through the streets of amuni guagbeni idiko nibada at the same time, this uh, former governor of your, your, your state was also around Idiko and uh, Bere and so on and so forth. I saw poverty and so it was not difficult to begin to be, to stand for the right of others when I had a breather. Anthony Anahuru spent the night with you the day he landed in New York. He did, briefly, yes. Briefly. But he came back to spend four nights with me. And that is how you got hooked to him. I got hooked to him the first day he came, growing up in the secondary school when uh, uh, Chief Anthony Eru Masale Naro, blessed memory, was the Minister of our Information. Uh, as young men, young boys, we copied so many things from him. He was well dressed, uh, yes, handsome than we ever imagined that we would ever be, um, quiet disposition, but a firebrand. And Anthony Enaro moved the motion for independence of Nigeria in 1953, to which he was punished, he was returned during this treasonable felony and conspiracy. Was he punished? It was a punishment. Did you ask him? Was there a plan no, to topple the Tafawaga Balewa government? Yeah, they, they asked for him. They, they asked the British government to send him back. So instead of uh, when he escaped, uh, during the era of uh, the treasonable felony mm. of 1962, he was able to find his way to England 
Did he tell you there was a plot? Did he tell you Awolowo well, plotted a coup? No. No. The government, don't forget, if you, you to really understand what we're talking about, when the government was going to change Batin in 1960, to get the North to work with uh, Nigeria, to bring both of the, of the North and the South together, the North were promised 5 to 10 percent uh, increase in uh, their voting percentage, whether they earned it or not. So uh, the arrangement was lopsided from the beginning. And that's why uh, Dr. Namdi Azikwe was uh, a titular president, as bright as he was. Uh, Tafawa Balewa had a grade two teacher certificate. Uh, Dr. Namdi Azikwe had been involved with student movement and um, uh, other movements, working with Mosiah Agave and the rest of them in America. So for him to now to be second fiddle, to be number two in the Nigerian system, is frustrating. Did that not explain how the rain began to beat us? It did. And that's why we refuse. Some of us are able to see through their umbrella. That their umbrellas are perforated. And we must stand our ground to make sure that this must not continue. Unfortunately, unless care is taken, as we have been beaten on the left by the west, the Chinese are more, uh, mostling us from the, 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 the right. Very unfortunate. We are discussing Nigeria. We are discussing the struggle to actualize June 12. My guest, Jumoke Ogunkeyedi, was part of the struggle. After this break, we'll look at the role Anthony and Nauru played in the struggle. Don't go away. Bush Radio. Bush Radio. Bush, 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 Bush Radio. Your real talk radio. Reading is feeding the mind when he feeds his mind. His body is happy and he is rich. Feed the mind. Go to www.udarabooks.com Udara Books, feeding the mind. State Affairs with Edmondo Bilo is live. I'm discussing the book, A Moment in Time, A Life Experience in the Art of Survival, Politics, Humanity and Activism. But let me also read from another book. This time I'm talking about the book, Nigeria's Fourth Coup d'Etat, Options for Modern Statehood, authored by S.G. Koku and published in 1985. S.G. Koku in the book says the starting point has to be revolution in our political thinking. We have to undertake an agonizing reappraisal of notions and concepts that today are considered sacrosanct in our heritage of Western political thought. S.G. Koku. Who is S.G. Koku? Let's listen to this chat with Chief Ayo, the banjo. I want you to tell me, were you among those that were sent to Ghana to topple the Tafawa Balewa government? I had a big impression. We went to Ghana to study Nkrumah's form of organization, the CPP. You know, they were the ruling party then there. As, as an organizing secretary, we went there. That was what happened. There was no question of calling there to come and talk to them. But that, was that was the allegation when they wanted to get rid of the opposition. Was there a plan to remove Tafawa Balewa? We are only opposed to government. 
No plan to remove him all democratically. There was no plot no, I, I don't, to I remove don't him know. forcefully. I don't know about any plot to remove forcefully. But I know we are doing everything just the way uh, APC are, being, are trying to remove uh, the middle of time. Sam Ikoku was part of the AG. Yes. He was an Awolo man. Yes. So listen to what he said. He said, we were fed up with the way the Nigerian system, the Nigerian state, and the Nigerian government we are operating. We were deeply committed to a change of government, and we saw that waiting for elections would not produce any solution to the problem. This was what we did. We started preparations for it, and the preparations had gone very far, and I believe we would have pulled it off. But unfortunately for us, our leader was so kind to the Nigerian police that he had a police informant among his planners. And so the police knew every move we were making. And so it was easy to trip us up. Our leader even became the number two citizen in the country. I felt it was time to tell the country the truth so that our history would be correct. So all I'm saying is that Yes, there was an attempt to overthrow the government. Yes, I took part in the attempt. Yes, it failed. Thanks to people like MD Yusuf and Co. Chief Adibanjo, what do you have to say? That's his view. That, that's not my view. That's SG Koku talking. Not Ali Adibanjo. A member of the EG. Uh -huh. No. During the seasonable family, late Professor. Honorable gave evidence that he was a member of the planning committee to school. But when he was questioned at the trial, that's how never tried. You ran away. You did not come to the country during that treason trial, right? Yes. Why did you run away? I didn't run away. I would give you the background. By the time they were arresting people for uh as I will let the rally for detention. It was Shifa who always said we should not allow all of us to be arrested here. And that he was not going to leave the country. But there will be people who will be championing our cause abroad, telling what is happening at home. That was how myself and Ikuku and was sent abroad. Not because we ran that way. Ikuku was in Ghana too? Yeah, yeah, he was my leader in Ghana. So if Ikuku accepted this, why did he choose to accept? For some reason, I was asking. I, I thought you were going to confirm this story. No, no, I The reason I came to you with this I book. I know. I, I've had it before. You are not, you are not embarrassing me. It's not due to me. State Affairs with Edmond Dombilo is live. Tumba Jumoke Ugunke is on state affairs. I played that interview for you. Enahuru was a participant in that conflict. But he went to prison. What did Enahuru tell you about the school? Or he didn't mention it to you? Chief Enahuru never mentioned any uh, coup planned to overthrow any government. Uh, don't forget that... Uh, when Chief Enaro crossed over to the leader, Chief Awolowo, in 1949, he, he crossed over as a young, very activist. At the age of 21. At the age of 21. And at that time, he was just, uh, he, he was about the youngest within the inner circle of uh, Chief Obafemi Awolowo. It did not take time for our Lord to recognize how versatile uh, he was. And so when he would stand up sometimes to raise an issue, the older ones would say, young man, sit down. It's if our Lord that would say, hey, he has a right even to be wrong. And so he was uh, gradually allowed to be part of uh, uh, the, the kitchen cabinet. He told you that Zeke was his chairman. Awolowo was his leader. Yes, Zeke was his chairman. Awolowo was his leader. How? I think the story is in the book. 
uh, it was the youngest editor running a newspaper for uh, Zeik. Southern Nigerian the Defender. Southern Nigerian Defender. He was doing a good job. And will you believe our chief Venaro never wrote the secondary school leaving certificate exam? You know, you made that point and you caught my attention. You know, I thought he was well schooled. <laughs> you know, I never knew he was now who never went to a university. He never. And that's why he said he wanted the best for his children. He gave them the Oxford and the Yale education. But well, that's another story for another time. He also proved that sometimes you don't need a university degree to be a genius. Yes, I've always believed that. Even if you look at, even um, Professor Wale Shoyinka, who had a university degree, only had BA. English. The other thing he acquired, he never really got a PhD, but not too many people will know that. Chief Enaro said when he, uh, it's, uh, what's his name of this gentleman who worked for Professor uh, from Bini, who worked for uh, Abacha, he said, yes, Omo Omoru, he said, anytime Chief Venaro will make a speech or present a paper. General Ibrahim Babangida will get about eight of them to sit with him, all professors, to decipher the actual meaning of what Chief Venaro wrote. Actually, when uh, I got to know the type of man Chief Venaro uh, was, I started to collect his speeches. Those he made while I was with him, or if I could uh, get those he made before. He, I, I met him. He, he was blessed to the point that when he puts his pen to paper, he's writing, he's putting down the mind of a genius. Now, going back to our point, he might not necessarily have been privy to what was going on then. Don't forget that, one, as much as everybody at Awolowo accepted Venaro, the bulk of the Yoruba leadership at that time did not. They did not even accept his leadership of Afenifere. That's what I'm saying. They did not. And so because they did not, he might not have been privy to what they went to actually do in Ghana. But he paid for it. He paid for it. He went to prison. Several times. So he had gone to prison about four or five times before that time anyway. So he was becoming a jail board. You could count the number of people who went to political prisons in Nigeria uh, within the ten fingers. Uh, Ghani Fawemi and Le of late. Uh, Femi Falano, um, Professor Olesho Inka, and so on and so forth. But interesting thing that I want you to know today is Chief Enaro said since time immemorial, every other generation in his family ended up in prison. So he said, I ended up in prison. Most likely my children will escape. Or probably I don't know anything about my grandchildren. Maybe one or two of them will also go to prison. In your book, you said Enahuru believed that if Mortala Muhammad had spent more than six months in office as head of state, his reign would have been a study in misrule. Definitely. The same Mortala Muhammad? The same Mortala Muhammad. Uh, because the uh, example is when uh, Chief Enaru, uh, was sent as head of delegation to London to source funding for the Biafran war. And uh, when they were in the presence of the Prime Minister, I think Harold Wilson, uh, he said, Britain will not support the war in Nigeria as is. And they asked him why. He said, because your generals are killing children in the war front. Chief Enaro said, he asked him, do you have any proof? He said, Harold Wilson opened his drawer, brought out some pictures. Uh, the head of uh, Muritala Muhammad and his cohorts put guns to the head of 12, 13 year old boys, killing them. But he was known to be ruthless, though. Yes. Especially during the second coup, the Definitely. counter coup. Yes. And that's why the man said, We will not give you money until you tell your generals in the war front to stop killing children. And when Enahoro came back to when Nigeria and reported came, to the military council? Yeah, yeah Chief Enahoro saw Joseph Akinwale way as his mentor, his godfather, his big brother. Uh, gave him a not unofficial report of the joy of the trip and wondered uh, how he should present it at the, the Supreme Military Council. 
and Joseph Akinla Walewe, who was the head of the Navy then, just told uh, Chivenaro, why don't you discuss with your leader first? That leader was Chivaulawa. And he said he discussed with Awolowo and Chivaulo said, present it as is. During the next music country, when you have to make your report about your trip to Britain, on presenting it, he had to now back it up with the pictures. Gawa was the head of state. Muritala Mohammed was part of the Supreme Military Council at a point in time. Muritala Mohammed stood up and started banging on the table. Who are you talking about, you bloody civilian? At that time, he talked with a harsh and strong voice. Who one could not control him. Gawan admitted that he was the most difficult to control. Because they brought him to power. Because they, yes, they brought him to power. Gawan wasn't part of the coup. No. Gawan it was, was Motala Mohammed and Co. Yeah, it was because they didn't know who should take over amongst the core northerners. That they said, let's use uh, this uh, gentleman, this young man. And he could not control them. He could not. So and they, they finally had... booted him out in 1975. They did. They had to bring Gawan in from who was at that time almost approaching Ghana to... Oh, head the, the Nigerian system. Also, when he said that, I will now now uh, whisper to Gawan, please control your man. But Gawan could not. At that time, Awolo stood up and walked out of that meeting, followed by his uh, uh, group, Enaro and the rest of them, followed suit. And so Gawan went and appealed to Awolo to come back I said, no, we will not come back unless you are able to tame the, this your shrewd. You must tame him. And he confessed to our law, it's difficult to, 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 to tame him. Then he said, then talk to whoever can uh, tame him. I will not come back. So, Gawan had to talk to the emirs, who like, were, were like demigods at that time, and they told him to pipe low. And that was, they moved him out of uh, uh, Lagos, and so Gawan was able to con uh, go back to what he was doing. And he dealt with Enauru in his own way. When he became head of state, he seized Enauru's house. He was he went to our Enauru's house and took away the, 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 the <laughs> generators and things like that. I said to spite him. And uh, if not for the MS, he probably would have uh, uh, had uh, Chief Enauru killed or kidnapped or jailed or something. Enauru could not become Nigeria's leader. Awolowo could not become Nigeria's leader. None of them. I wonder why. Did Enauru tell you? Uh, Enauru was still hoping, and the rest of them, Bolaige and the rest of them, were still hoping that Chief Awolowo would have the opportunity to run Nigeria. With the, uh, the people like uh, Ajasi, uh, uh, the... the Jawachuku and the rest of them, who were our local uh, supporters. And so that they never thought of themselves. The only one who ever thought of himself was Latif Jack Andy, when he was baited by the Babangida. That why should you call somebody Baba, Baba, Baba? Can't you be the next Baba? Even well, now, at the point, left UPN and went to NPN. Simple reason, because the Yorubas came together. The Lani uh, who are the uh, my leader, Papa Yadi Banjo is still alive, so I will do the honor. I will not mention his name. When some Yoruba leaders came together and said, "Yes, Azik, uh, Enaro might be uh, close to Awolowo, he might speak Yoruba like the best of us, but he's still not a Yoruba man. So he cannot be the leader of Afeni so Ferry. He cannot be the leader of Afeni Ferry, although." Chief Venaro said he regretted the, the, the decision, but he said it was the best option at that time. That uh, how do you do this much? His father was the principal of Imadi College of Owo. He was uh, uh, raised in Owo amongst Yoruba kids. He was fluent in Yoruba and he served all his life in Yoruba line. So he was hanging in between, not definitely accepted by his people. Of a dough extraction, not absorbed by uh, the Yoruba people that he thought he was serving. He became the leader of Nadeko. Yes. Did he achieve his dream? Will he be happy with the present Nigeria? No. Because now let me say this. When a time in 1999, when Abdul Salami Abubakar 
came to power, he sent a message through Chibolaige to Papa Adesaya. And the message get, got to us in the U.S. that uh, Abdul Salam Yawubaka wanted to talk to Chief uh, Enaru and the Nadeko as a whole, that he didn't see himself as the enemy of Nadeko. Uh, and so some people raised the issue that maybe we should stop Nadeko's struggle and work with this man. I remember we really Chief Enaru kicked against it. He said, the best military is not as good as the least civilian. Was that decision the best, considering those who hijacked power and have not taken over the Nigerians there? Yeah, those people disagreed because it was put to vote. Those people who want to work with uh, Abdul Salami, Abu Bakr government, uh, well, some of them decided to work with him. Like Tinubu? Yes, like uh, Tinubu. They came to Nigeria. Uh, Chief Enaro said, if we give them in less than three months, if we don't go work with this government, the government will fall. We will be able to actualize the regionalization and the restructuring. We were asking for sovereign. We, may not, we should not forget that. Sovereign national conference. Is that what you are calling for now? I've always called for this since I heard it from my leader, Chief uh, Antonio Romasele Enaro. The Nigeria is going nowhere unless we do sovereign national conference and you it it, it 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 pains me i cry inwardly uh the way nigeria is going it's just like uh somebody who's going to home never reach home is going to the farm never reaching farm hanging in between that is the, the fate of nigeria now and because i'm an optimist we will get there one day but it doesn't seem clear now Thank you for featuring on State Affairs. I thank you very much for the opportunity. And your book is quite interesting. A lot of story here, but we just chose a part to look at. Thank you. I should invite you again. I look forward to it, and I appreciate you. I am Edmond Obilo. Thank you for listening.